Canada and to to Michael Pele in um and am I saying that right Michael I am right I'm one of the few kind of like pa Polly would be Polly Polly 10 out of 10 but so you're not you're not the soccer player Pele <laughs> <laughs> so so here we are again and i have to apologize for my covid hair because uh it's way too long but you know i'm i'm trying to to do the right thing and i live in kitchener waterloo which is now the only place in north america where the hairdressers are still closed so um, i'm thinking of going into toronto next week and getting a haircut so welcome everybody thank you very much for joining us and i see some familiar faces uh, welcome and uh, as per usual, we'll just have you put any um, any questions you have in the chat, please. And Michael, I'll interrupt Michael regularly and ask him to uh, answer those questions. And uh, Michael's done this so often, he can probably do the chat himself, but I'm still here and Anais is here to help us too. Thank you, Anais, for setting this up and doing all of the logistics. We sure appreciate that. And uh, we're trying a bunch of wines tonight. tonight and. I already have one open that Michael will join me later in and uh, cheers to everybody. It's great to see you and over to you, Michael Polly. Cheers. Well, hello everybody and welcome. And uh, I'm speaking to you from uh, my flat just north of Oxford. So it is, um, it's just gone 10 o'clock here and uh, I've been deliberately not having a drink all evening, saving myself for you guys. Um, so without further ado, I think we should just tuck in um, right. Obviously, the plan was to taste all the wines um, in the catalogue with you, but we weren't allowed to do that. So this is my kind of edited highlights. And um, there's three estates on which I'd like to focus. So one is Zucchetto, who's the Prosecco producer. Um, the second is E. Pastini, which is a producer in Puglia, with whom um, we've worked for a really long time. Um, he was one of the first estates we introduced to Pimian and has kind of become a really firm favourite. And um, the biggest selling wine from him is, is the Primitivo, but we're actually not gonna taste that. So I wanna taste a, a different wine with you tonight to introduce you to something that you won't have come across before, which is um, Minutolo. Um, and then for the first time ever, so this is kind of the real highlight, for the first time ever, um, I've designed my own range of wines, um, which Opimian have decided to list, Jane decided to list them this year from Sicily. So we're really excited about that. And I wanted to spend a bit of time talking to you um, about those wines. So tonight is going to be action packed. We've got about uh, 50 minutes to go through everything. Um, this is your opportunity to um, ask as many questions as you want. Um, I am a little bit more background. I'm Canadian by birth. Um, I was born in Toronto, grew up in Creemore, um, which some of you may know is just south of Collingwood, um, about 100k north of Toronto. Um, I did a degree in English and philosophy at the University of Toronto moved to the UK in 1989, qualified as a Master of Wine in 1995, and I've specialized in Italian wines ever since. And uh, we've been working with the uh, Pimian Society for, I think this is our fifth year um, where we've been working together and I've been on a, on a kind of speaking tour of Canada um, and got to know lots of people. And, um, and we're, uh, you know, I sort of can't tell you how much the Pimian Society means to the producers um, for whom Canada is an incredibly difficult market. If you think that you've got 10 different provinces and you've got, um, you know, different legislation in all of them. Um, and in theory, you know, I mean, if you wanted to sell into PEI um, or one of the smaller provinces, you'd still need to go through all the agency rigmarole to find an agent there and so on. And so the Opinion Society allows people to access wine lovers all over Canada, kind of one-stop shopping um, with an incredibly efficient team that just makes the whole process as easy as it could possibly be. Um, so for those of you who uh, have been kind enough to join this, and let me start by saying, you know, heartfelt thanks from all our producers who, who really love you guys. Um, and thanks for your support. I know sometimes in this sort of online world, it's difficult to ever see if you're really making a difference. And I just want to tell you that you are. Um, so there's lots of producers that are really, really grateful for the business. And, um, you know, they're small, uh, you know, one man or woman bands, um, and, you know, the orders in the opinion society are sufficiently large that it really does make a difference. So anyway, that is the end of parish notices and on to um, alcohol. So uh, the first wine, so we're going to taste by a state and, and the first wine is, is this one from Zucchetto. 
So there's a bunch, I'm just going to hold that up there. Oh, look at you, you <laughs> fancy Prosecco, Michael. So, um, okay. So I'm just, I'm going to, the, the, the label here is going to be kind of the star of the show. And there's, there's a bunch of stuff that I want to tell you about here. So the, the biggest, okay, the biggest thing with Italian wines that, that you need to be aware of um, is that Italians can pronounce them, but they don't necessarily know what they mean. Okay, so there's a difference between able to say it and actually understanding what it means. So don't let the weird, bizarre nomenclature put you off enjoying Italian wines. The, 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 the labels put so many people off and that makes Italy an even better source of value for money wines than most countries. Um, and, and there's that sense of excitement. So I'll tell you what all this means. Um, so Zucchetto, that's his name. Okay, so that's his name, his, that's his surname. Um, his name is Carlo Zucchetto. And Zucca means pumpkin, unfortunately. So his name is loosely labeled as, as it loosely translates as, as, as little pumpkin. But a Zucchetto is also the hat um, which the Pope wears. So um, those would be two, I guess in the playground, he was teased either by being the hat that the Pope wears or a little pumpkin. Anyway, there we are. Sounds rough, Michael. It, exactly. <laughs> so Valdo Biadene, so the word underneath that is that the town, and I'm going to come back to why that's important, then extra dry, okay? So extra dry is a legal term like brute, and it refers to the residual sugar level, and more of that in a minute. And then in the fine print underneath, it says Azienda Agricola Paolo Zucchetto. So two words about Azienda Agricola. This is the most important term in Italian wine legislation, and it's not a wine term. It is a tax term, azienda agricola. It means agricultural estate, okay? Why it's important is because if you are an azienda agricola, you do not pay tax on your profits, okay? So it's to encourage agriculture. So you could be an azienda agricola for jam, providing you made jam from your own fruit. You could be an azienda agricola for wicker baskets, providing you made the wicker baskets from your own willow, okay? So providing you make something from your own produce, you do not pay profit on it, all right? You can also reclaim your VAT. So everybody, but everybody wants to be azienda agricola in Italy for that reason. And therefore it is very, very carefully protected and the legal definition is in you cannot buy in anything. You cannot buy in fruit, right? It has to come from your vineyards or your orchards or whatever. So if you think about what that means for wine, it means you cannot buy in any grapes. And therefore, it is a term of quality, even though it's not intended to be that. So if you see it's the end of Agricola on a label, watch out for that. That is a sign that that estate is legally registered as a, a, like a, a tax-free entity and as close as you're going to get to a guarantee of quality in Italy. All right, back label. Um, so more fun and games here. Okay, so Zucchetto we can see again, and then underneath that we've got Valdo Biadene, and I'm just trying to get the camera. Yeah, it's, it's very fuzzy. Okay, it will But zoom we in. believe you, we can't read it in, in Italian anyway, no, it'll so you zoom, go right it'll ahead. Zoom in. Anyway, I will, I will keep going. Um, yeah, and I have to so, say that for a, for a hyphenated Brit, like Brit, British Canadian, your yeah. Italian is excellent. Oh, bless you, thank you. Um, I've had a couple of Italian girlfriends, if I'm honest, across uh, yeah. the years, which have helped. Okay, so um, this is DOCG. So denominazione d'origine controllata e garantita. So most Prosecco you'll come across is DOC. This is DOCG, big difference, okay? So if you're the other Prosecco, which we have in the catalog, the 84, that is DOC. Um, and this is Superiore from Val de Biadene. And then the other thing is it's vintage dated. So this is 2020. So very, very few bottles of Prosecco are vintage dated, okay? So the things, just to summarize, what makes this different from most Prosecco you're going to find, and one of the reasons why it's so expensive, number one, it's from his own fruit, okay? He's at the end of Agricola. Number two, it's Superiore DOCG, which is from the best bit, which is tiny, 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 tiny bit of the entire bit. Prosecco, okay, today they make half a billion bottles of Prosecco, all right? 99.5% is DOC, 
Okay, so this is 0.5% of the production is DOCG. So this is really the creme de la creme, right? And um, yes, those, those are the main differences. So I'm now gonna take my life in my hands and open this live and online, which you should never do. Not toward um, the camera. So yes, not <laughs> pointing at my laptop. Um, so it's, uh, the, you can get Prosecco with a string over the, over the top. Um, and this is, is, is with uh, the muzzle. So mushroom cork and muzzle. Um, and Prosecco is made in the tank method. So it is not made in the champagne method. And there's a very good reason for that. It's not made in the champagne method because they're not trying to create champagne. They're trying to create a wine which is, preserves that primary fruit character of the, of the Glera grape. So Prosecco is the wine, Glera is the grape. See if I can still do this. Uh, so, and in the interest of uh, of wine education, it, I noticed that you turn the bottle, not the cork. Turn the bottle, not the cork. Forty five degree angle, preferably right. pointing away from anybody, unless there's somebody that you don't like. Right. Um, and then uh, and let her smoking. fly. And then let it fly exactly. <laughs> and there's uh, there's a, a punt in the bottom of the bottle. This a little bit of wine education again. The punt here. Uh, everybody thinks it's a sign of quality. Um, it's not. It's just that when they put the punt in, that's the weakest part of the bottle. So when the bottles were lying in the cellar, if they exploded, they will explode out this way. So they would they would explode out um, axially rather than radially. And then they would just go pop, 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 pop out of the mound of bottles and not destroy all the bottles around them. So that's why we have the punt. And uh, so this is 2020, but it's ready to drink. Now, one of the things about Prosecco is that you actually can keep it, um, particularly good Prosecco like this. I'm not saying you can keep it as long as champagne, but you can definitely keep it for a couple of years. And I've, yeah, so when, when we were there, um, when, it, when it was possible to travel, um, he, he opened like loads of stuff that he kept um, in the cellars. And it was amazing. It doesn't age like champagne. It's not meant to be champagne, but it did take on some really, really interesting characteristics. Um, so cheers, everybody. This is the first wine. So um, Michael's going to keep us posted in the chat box about what the wine is um, and, and the numbers so you know which one it is. So this is on page 32, and this is Ducato Valdebiadene Extra Dry Prosecco. So I mentioned extra dry. Actually, well, let's taste it first. So on the nose, and this is, here's what I love about this. It smells of glera. If you got this blind on an exam, you stick your nose in that, and you go, it's Prosecco. Mm. So um, melon, honeydew melon, apple, pear, touch floral like acacia. Um, it's just got, it's just got a beautiful, fresh, non-autolytic nose. It's, it's, it's mm. a delight. It's interesting that you say, I would know it was not champagne if it was blind on a, on, on a test for sure. Yeah, yeah. So nice persistent mousse. I know you don't have it in front of you unless you bought some last time around. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, fills them out. There's that creaminess on the palate, really lovely length. And in terms of food match, the Prosecco is the Italian aperitivo, okay? In terms of matching it with food, don't bother. It's not its role in life. Um, and you can just tart this up with a bit of uh, Aperol um, or Campari, top it up with this um, or half this, half soda if you want something a little bit weaker. Um, classic Afro spritz, uh, and that's what its role in life is. Um, the, the other thing, I mean, if you, want, if you want a slightly sort of posher version, you can make a Bellini um, using white peach puree, but it is an aperitif, and I love it just like this. I think this is just such a great way to start a meal. It doesn't cost a fortune. You don't have to worship at the altar of champagne, just really good sparkling wine. And I, I will confess, Michael, that I'll, I'll often have a sparkling like this with pizza. I just, uh, I really enjoy something really easy yeah. going like that and, and just enjoy it. It tarts up the, the pizza. Yeah. No, so, it, 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 it yeah. does. And um, people, you know, with champagne, people often say, you know, champagne goes with caviar. Yeah, I can assure you, having worked for Caviar House in the UK, it does not. The point about champagne and caviar is they're both really expensive. And that is where that match ends. I think it goes with caviar's vodka. Mm. But because caviar is expensive and champagne's expensive, people think they go well together. Um, and they just, you know, they just don't. So, um, and again, you know, uh, you're talking about pizza. I, I think, you know, fish and chips, I mean, that kind of comfort food, actually, Prosecco is really good with it. 
yeah. got a nice lively bit of acidity, good length, um, and it works a treat. So there we are. Beautiful. Good. Any questions up to this point? Uh, can I have more? And, and the answer is yes. You good? Well, you got a whole bottle. There, okay. There. So, now this is, um, you know, not quite a, not quite a world first, but um, the first time it's going to get tasted in Canada. So the law changed last year, and um, they allowed rosé prosecco. Okay. So here's some things you need to know. The the law says that you must use Pinot Noir, okay, as the red component in the Rosé Prosecco. It is a blended wine, right? So it's not Sagné, like the way they make some Rosé Champagnes, where they're pressing the Pinot Noir um, and getting a white juice. This is blended red wine, Pinot Noir, uh, with the Glera grapes, put them together, and, and you get this Rosé wine. So Carlo didn't want to make this at first. So we had a long chat about Rosé Prosecco. He goes, you know, my family's not done it. I'm not really a Rosé Prosecco guy. And I said, look, why don't you do it and do a good job, do a really good job on this and make a great Rosé Prosecco. So he hummed and hawed and we discussed it at length. We finally agreed to do it. Um, and I've worked with him on the blending of this all the way along. And I am delighted, delighted with the results. So you have an option on your order form um, to get a mixed case. So three bottles of the extra dry and three bottles of the rosé. Um, and I, I would urge you to do that. I think the rosé is- I'll awesome. be doing that, no question. It's just yeah. brilliant. So the Pinot Noir, 15% Pinot Noir. I can't tell you where the Pinot Noir comes from because this session's being recorded. And if I did tell you, I then have to go and kill you all. Mm. Um, but take my word for it. We have worked incredibly hard um, to source fabulous Pinot Noir for this, okay? The, the, the Pinot Noir in question is, is seriously good. Um, the other thing we did is we vintage dated it. So it's 2020. <clears throat> and why is that important? Well, it's important because the law, this is Italy. So as soon as there's a law, there's a way around the law. So they said, well, it's only eligible from 2020. That's what the law says. However, if you don't put a vintage on it, you can use 19 as well. So this then became, Rosé Prosecco has become a tank clearing exercise for everybody within the DOC. Why? Because whatever crap you had left over from 19, you can tart it up with 15% Pinot Noir, call it Rosé Prosecco and put it on the market. So that undrinkable base wine that you didn't sell from 19, all of a sudden has a new lease of life, okay? And of course, that isn't what we're doing here. And that's why it is vintage dated. The other thing, and, and I don't know if you can pick this up on the um, label, probably not. So it's vintage dated here and it is DOC. And the reason for that, and I'm, I'm, I wanna make this really clear, the reason why it's not DOCG like its other wine is the law does not allow DOCG Rosé Prosecco. So this is DOC Prosecco Treviso, which is the highest DOC he is allowed, okay, to use, because he can't use DOCG. I assure you, I promise you, that it is 100% DOCG fruit for the 85% of this wine, which is Glera, and the 15% is incredibly carefully sourced Pinot Noir. And Please don't last... tell us where it's from, Michael. Sorry? Please don't tell us where it's from. I, I, I don't, I don't want to die. I cannot and will not tell you where it's from. And then the last thing to say is that the um, uh, the dosage, so the, the, the extra dry, which we talked about before, is 15 grams per liter of residual sugar. And with the rosé, my concern was that because you've got this quite overt Pinot Noir fruit, that if we, if we stuck at 15, it was going to be too... Um, it was going to be too sweet and too cloying. So I dropped this down to six grams per liter. So the other thing on the, on the back label, which you can't see, is technically it is an extra brute. Okay. So this is, you know, th that, that's the term they use, extra brute. So like brute zero or brute nature. So it is really, really dry. And that gamble has paid off. So this is, it's a beautiful, I mean, actually quite a dark kind of salmon pink. And that's because of the quality of the Pinot fruit that we're using. And then the nose, 
this has got that kind of um, fresh strawberries, wild strawberries, um, raspberries, red currant. And then on, on top of that, you got the Prosecco part, which is the melon and the apple. And it really works well together. So the nose is just a joy. And everybody in the UK I show this to goes, yeah, 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 Rosé Prosecco. We don't sell Rosé Prosecco. You know, we're a really posh wine shop. Rosé Prosecco is not for us. I go, yeah, yeah, okay, taste it. And they taste it and go, yeah, no, we'll buy that. Mm -hmm. So um, it is it is really working here. And and of all the wines in the catalog, um, including the wines that I blend in Sicily, I think these are great. They're just fabulous. Can't wait to try it. I cannot wait. Oh, and Paul has a question. Is there a recommended temperature to chill Prosecco and is it the same for Rosé and for uh, the other? Yeah, like six, so. Yeah, really cold, right? Yeah, really cold. I mean, my, yeah. I think my, fridge, my fridge here is um, eight, so yeah, six to eight. Yeah. I took and these then, out and cool. while you're still drinking the bottle, put it in some ice, Paul, keep it cold as you're uh, working your way through the bottle. That's always good too, especially if you're outside. Mm. Anyway, I know you don't have this. So I'm not going to go on about how delicious it is because that's mm -hmm. just. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm enjoying anyway. the one I've got. It's extra dry, and mm. I I hope you have something nice to drink while we're going through this. But I, I do. I, this is long. It's fine, and um, <laughs> you know, I don't know how much of summer will be left by the time you get hold of this, but it will definitely keep till next year, mm. um, to next summer. But it's just, uh, you know, right now it is just we're flying through this. It's great. Good. All right. Okay. So I think that's the first chapter. Um, any any other questions, thoughts, or comments? Do you have the catalog there, Michael? I do, actually. Yes. Yeah. Somebody very kindly posted it to me. That's so, great. Um, page. So you're looking at page thirty-two, thirty-three is the spread for these two. Oh yeah, that's that's lovely. Yeah, and so that's that's Carlo there in that picture in the top left and, corner. And you wrote for us, and uh, oh, I and, did. I forgot that. Yes. Yeah. Oh, I suppose and I'll tell you, we had quite a time finding um, photographs of people enjoying pink prosecco or pink sparkling. They mm -hmm. all they all looked too Christmassy and New Year's Eve. -y, so yeah. I think I hope you like what we chose there. No, it looks Look, really good. Looks festive. It does. So out of that, I mean, the, the mixed case would be kind of the. It's definitely know. the one I'm in for. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's where you. Because I also want to get yours, your, your first terra firma. So, you know, I yeah. can't get it all. So just before we go on to the terra firmas, I, I, I singled out this because I again, I, I really like this. So um, this is uh, from Epastini. So this is Rampone is the, the name of the vineyard and Manutolo is the grape. And Valle Ditria is um, uh, is the region. So this is on page. I just saw this. Um, this is on page. I would help, 15. but I don't know. <laughs> page on page fifteen. So uh, e pastini. So just a, a, a little bit of history on this estate. Um, so pa up. Epastini are the hose. So the hose, you know, the thing that you would you would you would hoe the, the furrows with between the vines. So the hose, that's what the that's what the name means, Epastini. Um, and the photograph there, that's Gianni Carparelli. Um, it's his father that uh, that Donato who set up the estate. And um, and then Gianni studied viticulture and his uncle teaches viticulture at Lecce University, okay? So this is kind of the, the USP for this estate. So his uncle teaches viticulture and for many years has sort of been a bit of a savior for forgotten great varieties of Puglia. Um, and so they make, they work exclusively with native grape varieties. And you can see that we've got four wines on offer. Now of these four wines, I'll tell you a little bit about all of them. So the one that sells the most by, you know, by a country mile is the Macrame Primitivo. Okay, so that's A, the, the least expensive. Um, and it's also the grape variety Primitivo, which, which lots of people know and love. It's the same grape variety as Zinfandel. And it is very, very drinkable. Okay, 
Then the one above that in the reds is Susumen yellow. Susumen yellow is the name of the grape variety, the rather unpronounceable Puglian grape variety. And um, yeah, so it so it's kind of much um, well, it's much more skeletal compared to the Primitivo. So the Primitivo is kind of plump, easy to enjoy, um, really rich, powerful red. Susumen yellow is much more linear, kind of more tobacco, smoky, chocolatey kind of aromas, and much more structure. And we still ripe and generous in that kind of Pugliese style. Puglia is the heel of Italy. Um, so poking into the med, it's very warm, you know, uh, and it's the, the heel part is flat, okay? The, the actual, the bit, the peninsula, the, the Salentine Peninsula that pokes out into the med um, is very flat. And, uh, and there's no mountains either. I mean, it is flat and, and, and near sea level. And then the first white is Loco Rotondo. So of the four wines, Loco Rotondo is the only one which is DOC. Um, and Loco Rotondo is an ancient white DOC that combines a bunch of local grape varieties. So Bianco della Sana, Verdecca, and Minutolo. Okay. And then the, the, the white grape, which is unquestionably the kind of Rolls Royce of all of them, um, is is the is the Minutolo. So um, some people call it Fiano Minutolo because Fiano is a bit better known, but it's, that's not its name. Its name is Minutolo. Um, and it is the the, um, the the absolutely the white grape variety um, of Puglia and I and I love it. So he Minuto is a grape variety which has sort of been on the brink of extinction um, and his family have saved it from extinction and is vinified oh. in stainless steel. So this is 2019 vintage. But I've I've got the 19. What are you guys getting? We're, we're, we're offering the 20. Okay, so we haven't shipped the 2020 yet. Mm -hmm. um, I've got the 19, which is fine because you'll see how well it ages. Um, and we've offered this for a few years now. It, it sells. I mean, you know, people people like it. But given how weird and wonderful it is, it would just be nice if a few more people tried it because it really, mm -hmm. you know, it really is its own character. Um, and it's not a great variety you'll come across anywhere else. And one of the nice things about opinion is, you know, you're able to try these things that, you know. You know, if you, you're the LCBO or the SAQ or whatever, your people are probably going to take the time to buy it. Um, I bet you there's not another bottle of it in Canada unless you buy it from Opimian, which is really cool. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm sure I, I, I don't know of any other Minuto yeah. being sold out there. I mean, hardly, hardly anybody makes it. Yeah, it's fab. Yeah. So just a few questions I can see. What kind of glass should we use to drink Prosecco? Uh, sorry, Kim Chen, that yes. I ignored you up until now. No, no, she was late. It's all Kim Chen's fault for sure. Okay, well, we yeah. should blame her. <laughs> um, a flute, you should, you should drink it out of a flute. But I, I would also say here, as a good uh, left-leaning Canadian, that don't get too hung up about glassware, my God. Um, hey. <laughs> no, that's okay. Oh, and, and I think the reason she asked the question is you're doing it out of the the six ounce tasting glass, right? The That's a standard tasting glass for professionals such as yourself. Uh, it's a standard, everybody can buy them, right? I mean, I, yeah. I, I use ISO tasting glasses because they cost two pound 25. And, I'm <laughs> and then yeah. you just throw them in the fireplace, right? I throw yeah. them in the fireplace along with all the plates and then um, yes, right. move on to the next course. Excellent. Um, no, you know, I, I break them all the time. They don't cost a lot of money and they're fine. And I do have nicer glass where I've got Zalto for high days and holidays. But to be honest with you, for most of the time, I just drink out of an ISO. You know, they're reliable. They do a good job. And otherwise you just find yourself like you're getting trapped in this kind of spiral of, oh, have I got the right glass for you? Did I clean it properly? Do I need a separate dishwasher? Blah, blah, blah. Anyway, this is an ISO tasting yeah. glass. And uh, if it's good enough to get me through the MW exam, I reckon it's probably good enough. Yeah, fair enough. Okay, so but, but hey, Michael, this is much prettier. It is. Yes. It is much yes. prettier. I'll agree. Agreed. Cool. So, and we uh, had another Minutolo. question there about uh, Minutolo. Am I saying that right? Minutolo. Yeah, it's dry. Yeah. Yes. yes. It's dry. It is dry. Okay. Yeah. And, and Kim Chen apologized for being late. Thank you, Kim Chen. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the nose on this. So I said it's stainless steel, so there's no oak on this, and it's really wonderfully pronounced. And it is, if you've ever smelt muscat, it's a bit like muscat. Mm. So it's orange peel, orange blossoms. 
but there's also a richness to it. There's, there's red apple, peach, apricot, tangerine. There's a lot going on there. And this is a sort of wine that's got, a, the nose is, is relatively pronounced. And then on top of that, you've got nice weight and acidity um, without oak. And that's the key. I, I don't like oak. Oak is used to hide a multitude of sins. And, and is that a blanket statement, Michael, or do you have you found some wines that are that have been oaked that you've found it's added something to and very generally? Yeah. Oh, come on. It's all about balance. Yeah. You know, if, you, if you're looking at great red Bordeaux, you know, it can be sort of 80 percent new oak, but it, it handles it. The fruit handles it. Right. So it, it is about, but you know what, what oak would take, I think the problem is if in doubt people oak, because they think, well, it's a really expensive wine, therefore it has to go in, into oak. And that's not true. Plenty of wines are great, you know, without that. So particularly whites. Um, so what would you pair with Manutlo to eat? Okay, so my favorite, my favorite dish in all of Puglia is designed to go with this. And that's really simple angel hair pasta, so spaghettini, and with that, fresh sea urchins. So there's all along the, the Puglian coast are these little like cafes on the sea, you just drive up, also the same thing. And it's, it's, it's spaghettini with ricci or, or sea urchins. And they, they mm. scoop out, they've got bags of these sea urchins, that they've just died, and they cut them in half, scoop out the top and plop them on top of your pasta. Um, and it is simplicity and deliciousness itself. Um, and with that kind of saline, briny character of the sea urchin, this is just a dream. So that, that is what I would put. I'll admit to never having had a sea urchin yet, and I'm a foodie, I, I plan to try it. So now I know what wine to have with it for sure. Uh, you know, we should do, Mike, we should organize a member's trip to Puglia. And, Agreed. Um, and go and see Johnny, who's, um, he's just such a lovely guy. And uh, he, he, in fact, I, I think there was somebody from Opinion who did go. I seem to remember somebody wrote. Um, yeah, we're planning it? Italy in, in the fall of 22. So, right. so we'll definitely be in touch. Yeah, it's a, it is a magical place. And Puglia is really, um, you know, Puglia was originally colonized by the Greeks. So even within the terms of Italy's ancient culture, it's, it's very ancient. Mm. Um, and it is largely unchanged, all of groves, the vineyards, um, you know, the best fish, the best vegetables. Life is easy. So Puli is, yeah, it's a, it's a remarkable place. Is it the place with the truly, those, those round? The truly, yeah, exactly. So yes, well, he, yeah. he's actually, and so there's a valley which is famed for its truly, and that's called Valley Ditria. Um, and it's about 300 meters above sea level on this chalky plateau. And that's where his vineyards are. And there's four towns there, uh, which they call the white cities, Chita Bianca. Um, and there's Ostuni, Loco Rotondo, Martina Franca, um, and a fourth one, the name which escapes me at the moment. Um, and they sort of form a cross, and right in the middle is where his estate is. So he's in the heart of, of Truly Country. Lovely. Lovely. Yeah. Good. Okay. Um, I know you can't taste these, which is sad, but you will be shortly, I'm sure, when you buy them. Um, yes. Any other thoughts on that? I'm not seeing anything in the chat, and as you say, I don't have it in front of me. So, but but I think if it goes with that sea urchin, and and it's got to have some some real power on the on the um, uh, the the uh, what am I trying to say? Um, the acidity, right? So it's got some really nice yeah. uh, balanced. It's got. It's not alcoholic. Yeah. It's, it's not a yeah. big fat alcoholic wine, um, yeah. but it's got great persistence of flavor and acidity, mm -hmm. and that persistence of flavor really is its own it's it's a unique set of flavors you're not going to see elsewhere great we'll make sure that that food pairings in next year's catalog good 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 yeah. okay so shall we shall we scoot on to the um to the terra firma wines Please so this do. is a this is a project that um i started a few years ago in sicily and um so there's a, a particular um co-op there with which i've become friends and they have hundreds of members scattered throughout the island. And in fact, they've got three different wineries as well to cater for that. So they're really brilliantly set up for forward thinking. They really go ahead um, and they've got access to fruit from all different parts of Sicily. 
And a lot of people think Sicily is very hot and, and you'd be right if you thought Sicily was really hot, it is. Um, but you know, th there is a giant air conditioning unit on Sicily, which is called Mount Etna. So Mount Etna is 3,300 meters above sea level at summit. Um, there's a ski resort on summit. Um, so, you know, it, it is huge and very, very cold. And so depending on the altitude, um, the climate really changes a lot. And Sicily's very, very mountainous in the north. So sort of extending to the south from Mount Etna and all across the top of the, <coughs> sorry, all across the top of the, the island. And then in addition to that, the water around Sicily is kind of in two types. So the Tyrrhenian Sea, which is to the north of Sicily, is very warm. So the water off the mountainous northern coast is just idyllic. And if you're a sailor, then that is one of the, you know, the greatest parts of the world to sail. And then the water off the south coast is actually on a, on a current that comes straight in from Gibraltar. Um, and it's quite cool. So relatively speaking. So it, it isn't as simple as it originally looks. And because they've got vineyards all over the place, they've got access to, to these different climatic factors. That's what I loved. So I approached him with this idea of, you know, I love Sicily, love the native grape varieties, and would really like to, you know, have a go at, at, at putting together something which is my own wine. Um, and they were really enthusiastic about it. And they said, yes, absolutely. So over the years, experimented with lots of different wines. I've got to say that this year just gone was horrendously difficult. Um, obviously, I couldn't get out there. Everything was, um, you know, sent across to be blended. Um, they kind of know what I'm after. They could by now, you know, they know the formula that I want. Um, and they're really good about it and super happy with the wines that they've come up with. Um, and I'm also really pleased to say that two of these wines are exclusive to Opinion. Um, and uh, I, I don't, you know, I don't have them here. In fact, they're, they're exclusive oh. to Opinion. So the, the first of those is the Grillo, um, and we've changed the packaging. I took advantage of 2020 to change the packaging. So the packaging which you see here is the old packaging, um, and the packaging which you're going to have is, is that pictured in the catalog, um, mm -hmm. which I think is a lot nicer. And um, the, the Grillo which you're getting, I'm going to be tasting the Catarato, but the Grillo which you're getting is um, slightly... It's slightly richer, I suppose. I think if I could do it all again, I'd probably go with the Grillo and the Nero Davila. The point was when we started, I, I, I love Catarato. Catarato is a great variety, which has got this wonderfully pure flavors. Um, but the problem with it is you, you kind of need to get the acidity just, just right. Um, and Grillo is slightly more forgiving. And But now everybody in the UK is buying the Catarato and it's going to be too difficult for me to unpick that and start introducing the Grillo. But for opinion, where we were starting afresh, um, this is the first year that you guys have listed these. I thought, yeah, no, I'd, I'd like to go with, with the Grillo. Um, so the Grillo is sourced from Western Sicily. Grillo was the original um, Marsala grape varieties. Uh, and there's a separate DOC for Grillo called Alcamo. Um, and it, the separate DOC, because it's kind of held in high regard in that part of the world is one of the sort of the premium um, Marsala grape varieties. Um, and so there would be, yeah, Grillo, Ansonica, Catarato, and Damaschino would be the big Marsala grape varieties. And of those, Grillo's kind of the richest, the composite was always the one that provided sort of the backbone for, um, for Marsala. So um, the nose on that, I think less citrus fruit probably that, than you would get in the Catarato. The Catarato would sort of be characterized as citrus fruit um, and more stone fruit. So peach, apricot, apple, that kind of thing um, in the grill, more weight, more body and more alcohol. And I think in terms of food, that makes it really versatile. So you could put that with pasta, fish. I mean, even up tuna, of course, is the big thing in Sicily. The best tuna in the world comes from Sicily. The mm -hmm. tuna that you see in Japan in the fish market selling for um, thousands of pounds a kilo, that all comes from Sicily. Um, and tuna there, they have the, the tuna factories all around the coast in Sicily and in Sardinia. Um, and tuna is a huge thing there. And with Grillo, it's just perfect for that. So fish, but it doesn't have to be tuna. It would go well with salmon or sea bass, but it's got the weight to go with tuna. Tuna is always that fish where some people put red wines, um, some people put white wines. And in terms of the winemaking, super simple. So just stainless steel. Again, I'm really, if the fruit's good, you don't need to do anything else. Um, it's a wine which I'd suggest drinking 
in its youth, but um, the Cataratto I've got here is 2019. So it's still fresh as a daisy. So in fact, hmm. it's lovely. Yeah, so, Jane's yeah. given it a, a two-year window here for the Grillo. Yeah, easily, easily yeah. two-year window. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then I'll tell you a little bit about the Rosato. So um, the, the Rosé isn't a wine um, that, uh, that I'd made before, but the opportunity was obviously to do a red, white, and a rosé, which just seemed like too good an opportunity to pass up. And one of the great varieties that they vinify there, and I've tasted every time I've been down, is the Sangiovese. So um, last year we were talking about uh, we were talking about what to do and so on, and I said, well, could you vinify the Sangiovese as a rosé? Because I think it'd be really good. And Tuscany makes loads of rosés from Sangiovese, as does the Marque. Um, and I just thought it'd be great to try it. Uh, and it's worked out really well. So it's Sangiovese, a little bit of Merlot, um, and fresh, super pale, um, so kind of Provence rosé color, um, really fresh nose, crushed red fruit, and um, yeah, a, a, a pleasant, um, easy to drink style of rosé um, that gives you all kind of all the fun of Provence for a fraction of the price. And and the Sangiovese grown on on Sicily, right? Yeah, so there's, I mean, you know, when I used to teach wine courses back in the day, one of the statistics that I always enjoyed recounting to people was that there were more vineyards planted in Sicily than in Australia. Um, and up until about 15 years ago, that was true. So the island is covered with wines from top to bottom. And mm. there is, if you think like, if you think about um, uh, Ansonica, so it's called Inzolia, in Sicily, but it's the same grape as Ansonica from the Tuscan coast. So there's a long history of swapping grape varieties between. Um, right. I mean, that's the thing. You always think of Tuscany when you think of Sangiovese, but it's, it's kind of cool that it's in this wine. Yeah, well, and don't forget there's Sangiovese and Sangiovese. There's tons of clones of Sangiovese, um, and it's planted in Romagna, it's planted in um, the Marche, uh, it's planted and it's planted in Sicily. So it does, it does venture. I mean, it, I, I, it reaches its peak in Tuscany, but it does venture outside of Tuscany as well. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. And then um, the wine, I guess, of which I'm the proudest is the Nero Davola. So um, this is a, a native grape variety like Grillo, um, but it's kind of, I don't know, I just, I adore Nero Davola. It's, and it is this, um, it's Superman, right? I mean, <laughs> Nero Davila is this like Mediterranean Superman. Um, and it, it, it can go literally from April to October without rain. I mean, it just, it's like, it doesn't need water. Um, and it's just adapted to that climate brilliantly well. And Avila is a town um, on the Southeastern coast, very, very hot. And that's kind of where Nero Davila, you know, that's its spiritual home, obviously around the town of Avila. But having traveled around Sicily many, many times, I found that you could, there's this other side to Nero Davila, um, which you get from colder climate fruit, which is grown higher up. Um, and that's what we tap into. So this wine is a blend of the Nero Davila from down near Avila, near Pechino and Avila in the south. And that's half of it. And then we blend that with um, fruit from vineyards, which are pretty far north near Palermo. Um, in the Palatrani Mountains. Um, and some of those are up to 700 meters above sea level. And I, I, this was the hardest wine to get right, to be honest, because the, the Nero Davila from Avila, I love, but it's just too juicy, too fat, too heavy. Um, and then you've got this cooler climate stuff from the north, which, and I just, I think the blending is, is the key to this. And just a really, really enjoyable glass of wine. So it's got kind of some of the plum uh, damsons, little bit, I mean, a tiny bit of that sort of date and fig baked fruit character that you get from the hotter climate fruit. But then there's this lovely floral, almost kind of like I describe it sort of like Mervedra, Bandol style, really floral, perfume, bright black fruit from the stuff from the north. And those two things come together to give you so weight and body. I think it's 14% ABV. Um, and yet at the same time, um, you've got the sort of slightly cooler climate, fresher, still really good acidity influence in it as well. 
So Andrew, one of our editors, has given the food pairing as uh, far sumagru. I don't know if you were familiar with it, but I had to look it up. And it's it's no. actually it's a Sicilian dish right. of of rolled beef, okay. and it it means false lean because of course they didn't have the money for lean cuts then. Right. And yeah, yeah. so yeah. so uh, it looks it looks really cool with an, an egg in the middle. Interesting. Yeah. Very interesting. interesting. So I would put this uh, with lamb. Uh, so lamb. You know, between pork, beef, and lamb, lamb is the fattiest meat. Um, pork's actually the leanest, so all the fat on pork is on the outside, but actually the meat itself is very lean. Um, and lamb's the fattiest meat. And I think with lamb, you need that combination of alcohol and acidity, um, which isn't that easy to find. And this is this just really yeah, this delivers that in, in a heartbeat. So lovely. Mm. Well, I'm looking forward to trying all three of those, Michael. I have I have ordered a case already. Thank you. There's there's that mixed case option again. Yes. Um, so, yeah. Well, and and that's that secret mixed case of of the uh, of the master's case, which is of three wines, and you're offering three wines of terra firma. So, you know, it's yeah. it's a it's a very poorly kept secret. And those of you on the call that aren't in the master's case program, this is the time to do it because you'll be able to try all three of Michael's wines. And uh, and I wouldn't be surprised if Michael's going to join Jane and talk about them when they come into Canada. So that should be a ton of fun. But, uh, oh, was I not supposed to say that? Yeah. Well, and and you know what? It's 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 you don't have to be uh, you don't have to be a genius to figure it out that that there's yeah. three wine three different wines in the master's case, and uh, you, we've offered three of your wines. So there you are. That's, yeah. Uh, and that, that's a good thing. So, so, and, and the master's case is supposed to be secret, but who cares? Like this is a, I think it's a great idea that you get a chance to try one of our new producers, which, I mean, Michael's been a partner of ours for a long, long time, but this is one of those labels that he's taken on for himself. And I'm really excited about trying your wines, Michael. Oh, um, thanks. Yeah. It's, 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 it's fine to represent somebody else's stuff, but when your name's on the back of it, you know, you, I don't know, like you just like, oh, I hope it's good. Yeah, you really try that bit harder. Yeah. Put your name on yeah. But, and I can say that, that uh, the way you talk passionately about all the wines you represent, you obviously put so much into it and you actually talk to, you're not just a marketing a wine, you're actually talking to the winemaker and, and understanding what they're trying to do and even giving them a sense of what, what to do to to market to bring that wine to market, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's essential because they they do work incredibly hard. But you know, all of that work is in their vineyard, so they you know, they're not out tasting wines from Chile or you know Argentina or France or Spain to get that kind of international perspective. And um, I think that's one of the things that, where we can help them is to say, look, you know, this is brilliant, but this is the sort of stuff you're going to be up against. Um, yeah. And, you know, like with the Rosé Prosecco, you know, Carlo was like, well, I'm not going to do that. My family doesn't make that. I was like, look, it's a real opportunity. Mm -hmm. So. And thank you for the writing you did in in the uh, seller offering about the pink Prosecco. And we really appreciate that. And it was really cool to to tell the members a little more about you as well. I was fortunate enough to to have to host you here in Kitchener a few years ago when you came. And so that was fun to be able to get uh, people to know you here in KW. And uh, and we'll good. do that again sometime. You do come to Canada from time to time, don't you? <clears throat> well, I, yes. If, if I can remember what restaurants and airplanes are, yes, then I'll be. There. Yes, that's right. Well, and here's a question that I'm sure that you, uh, if we have enough time for you to answer, has the pandemic had a major impact on the Italian wine industry? And I I know the answer that you're going to give, but you go ahead, Michael. Yeah. Look, I mean, you know, the I think there's three things to say. Um, as I was talking to a Barolo producer the other day, and he said to me, he said, vines don't get COVID. So the vines carried on their normal vegetative cycle. And in fact, 2020 was a fabulous vintage um, in almost all of Italy, but certainly in Piemonte, um, it, was, it was a really, really cracking vintage. Um, so that's the first thing. The second thing is that um, agricultural workers had this dispensation from the Italian government where they were classified as essential workers. So that was really important. So, uh, of course, back, you know, everybody, like, like everybody everywhere, you know, was worried about their job um, during the pandemic. So 
everybody turned up to work, you know, who was an agricultural worker. And, you know, there was social distancing in the cellars and so on, but basically the work got done. What didn't happen was the sales. You know, that, that, that's what didn't happen. Um, so all the local restaurants, and imagine, you know, I mean, Italy drinks a hell of a lot of wine and, you know, 98% of what they drink is Italian and, and that market just died, right? I mean, all the restaurants, and Italy's a country where people go out to eat, right? I mean, all the time. Um, and, and that just died overnight. And so that was the real, the real impact that I've had. But the vintage itself was brilliant. Most of the people were able to make great wines because none of their workers wanted to, you know, they were allowed to go to work and they were desperate for jobs and money. So they, they went to work. So that wasn't the issue. But really, you know, there's a lot of sellers now in Italy that are full of wine. And, you know, we started this presentation by saying thank you to all of you for supporting these guys. Um, and, you know, now more than ever, Thank you, um, because you know the opinion's been going strong. Obviously, people sitting at home drinking more wine, um, and that really has helped uh, you know, our guys. Mm -hmm. No, that's great. We're delighted to do it, um, and 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 uh, that's the thing. The on trade business is never going to be the same, I would think. And uh, and I understand that now that things are starting to open up again, it's logistics now about getting the wines to the restaurants that order it and all of those things. And we've had our own, uh, as members of Opinion, we've had our own logistic um, challenges as well. That, um, that you know, no empty containers, so they had mm -hmm. to wait. And so wines are taking a little longer to get into our cellars, but hopefully they order enough that they can wait for it to arrive when it does. Yeah. So any other questions, anybody? Um, Michael, thank you so much, very much for uh, again, speaking so passionately about your wines and uh, and drinking along the Zucchetto with me because I really enjoy having drinking buddies. That was a hardship. And I, I I really miss uh, the in-person events and hopefully they'll come back next year and really enjoy that. Thank you, Anais, for running the show here. Really appreciate that. And thank you all of the Opinion members for joining us tonight. And uh, I know my my budget is broken now because I'm going to have to buy pretty much everything that Michael tastes tonight, <laughs> and uh, and that's not a bad thing because I I really do enjoy them. And uh, so thank you everybody and uh, have a good evening, Michael. I know you've only just started drinking, so you're going to have to finish a couple of those bottles. And cheers. Yes, cheers everybody, and we'll see you on the next one. And hopefully I'll have a haircut by then. <laughs> good night everybody. Good night. Cheers. <laughs>